Did I miss any blanks, Lee? I don't think so. All right. I was in rare form. Oh, excellent. Okay. Let me get my notes out here. Uh, okay. Thank you, Jamie. So, any questions about parents and the responsibility of children? I got some things we can go down, but um, start here. Going to Don. Okay. Uh, not necessarily a question, but uh, kind of an observation. And last week you kind of pointed it out a little bit how this is the first commandment in the second table as we interact with other, yeah. our uh, fellow man. And the example you gave this morning about the, the, the man that was going to rebel against the king and how his father didn't uh, restrain him. Hmm. And to me, it's like, it's like the first commandment that leads to all the other ones. Because it's like if, if you don't have proper training coming up as a, a young person, you don't, the rest of the commandments are kind of yeah. gone. And so like society as a whole, we see it in yeah. today's world where there's kind of a sense of lawlessness and these young kids, you know, they don't, they, some hate their parents. And, you know, like what Serena said about not using discipline or not like, oh, I love my kids too much to to restrain them. And I think we're seeing the results of that. Well, no, let me, yeah, let me give you some of the details of that story. It's crazy. She was teaching in LA. My wife taught for three years in LA Unified Middle School. Uh, and she had a, a boy who I nicknamed Violent Mike. This kid had anger issues. He One day he uh, had a photo of his brother. He started stabbing with a pencil because his brother had t- taken something of his. I mean, he was just like, what are you doing? So he, at one point, um, grabbed her wrist and wouldn't let go of her. And she wasn't quite, she didn't want to get in a tug of war match with him. And so they had a meeting after school. And well, why did he do that? He, rather than doing his assignments, was writing a novel. And my wife had taken that and said she'd get back to him later. Oh, you took it from him. Yeah, he doesn't like that. Well, he wasn't doing his work. And basically, the individual learning plan for him basically was let him do whatever he wants. I'm like, do you see the connection between his anger issues and no one restraining him? I'm like, okay. But that's like, that was like, and they treat that like medical science. Well, he's been diagnosed with a, okay. Um, what tests, what empirical data do you have? None, but okay. Um, it's, it's just frustrating. But I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a, in the DSM-5, Diagnostic Statistics Manual 5, ODD, Oppositional Defiance Disorder. I mean, you just call it SIN. I mean, it's, no, you can look it up. The character doesn't deal well with instruction, doesn't like being told what to do, doesn't like correction. Like, yep, 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 check, 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 my heart, you know. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable how we've, we've taken things that are moral categories and, and in many cases turned them into sickness, disease categories. Because, of course, then no one's responsible. You can't repent being sick, right? But there's also no gospel, right, for being sick. I mean, there's no promise in the gospel that your, your disorder is going to get hit fixed. So it's, it's uh, the, the amount of confusion in our world over children is absolutely stunning. I mean, even, think of the cognitive dissonance even with the march for the chain for life, right? On the one hand... You can kill children, babies. You can kill them partially born. That's fine. And then how much does our culture freak out if they think you're mistreating your kids once they're in the world? I mean, just, I mean, so what is it? Are they disposable or are they precious and priceless? And their culture's like, yes! I mean, the cognitive dissonance of that is stunning. Um, and, and for a culture that's relativistic and doesn't believe in uh, and that doesn't believe in ethics and real morals, they're insistent that children are born good, and that anything that's wrong with them is environmental, which is again at odds with scripture. Like the kid comes into the world with the seed packets of sin in their heart, um, and 
So on this topic in particular, there's just so much conflict with the culture. Greg, get the man on the mic. I don't, I'm just sort of freeform spitballing off what you were saying, but yeah, I, I agree. That, you know, this is really a point where there's massive, massive disjunct and disagreement with the culture, and we just need to recognize that and not be ashamed of it. Greg. One thing that seems clear to me that all parents have precious few years to get this figured out. Yeah. And it, there comes a point of no return. I'm not sure exactly where it is. I, I wouldn't say to a parent, if you haven't disciplined, disciplined them by the time they're 13, you're sunk. Oh. But I kind of feel that way, that once that child is no longer in fear of their parents at all, well, you, you've, your ability to then deal with them has greatly been diminished and and uh because you you can't physically discipline them right. because they're too big right. uh, uh you know right. mother can't do it right. the child just says get away from me leave me alone whatever right. and you know i'm sure i'm not the only one that's been into a store and just wanted to plead with a mother you've got to get this a handle on this with this screaming child because one day that ability will be gone and, and we'll be housing them in the prison system uh, soon. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's another point I could make from this morning that came out in the series. You're their first authority. If they can't wrap their heads around the fundamental notion of I need to submit and order myself under your authority, the stakes only rise when the authority is Caesar, when the authority is God, when the authority is the employer, and if they can't learn how to honor and obey somebody who loves them and brought them into this world, they're going to have a merely impossible time with the police officer who doesn't love them and didn't, you know. And so in so many respects, these things, yeah, need to be learned in the house. Jeff Zimmerman, I remember him pointing out to me helpfully that uh, when we're tempted to smile or, oh, it's cute, when the kids are rebelling, just think about that behavior four years down the line, five years, and the roots are only going in deeper. Um, the patterns only become more entrenched. So, yeah, you want to you wanna deal with things, uh, you nip things in the bud. Um, Jake, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I, um, yeah. you spoke about it this morning about how when a toddler is defiant and oppositional, it's almost cute because of how ineffective they are yeah. but that grows up and that toddler becomes a middle schooler who won't let go of his teacher's arm and right. stabs pictures grows up i mean the sin matures as well and you got you know outside that limited time frame that grown up looks like murder or robbery or rape or something worse if there is something worse you know it because that's what it grows up into the do whatever you want grown up looks like that a grown up kid who's been taught do whatever you want will do what they want and it you know at any cost you know there, there's no there's no breaks on that also i just wanted to ask you something you didn't touch on this morning the doctrine of um expiation no <laughs> I, I do I've got, I've got a side note to go there so okay the doctrine of the um so Esteem. Self-esteem, yes, thank you. Sorry, I lost it. I had it, then I lost it. Self-esteem, yes. the doctrine of self-esteem that we hear a lot about kids today. I thought yeah. maybe you'd comment on that. <laughs> because uh, that's something else our culture believes in. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's Again, the Bible assumes we think far too much of ourselves. Um, what, what is frequently viewed as low self-esteem is unfulfilled pride. Meaning, um, if you think poor, if you're really upset because you're not achieving the levels you want to achieve, or you're not getting the respect you deserve, it fundamentally gets back to what you want, what you deserve. The part of me that wants everyone to praise me is the same part of me when people tease me, that hates it, right? Um, so I think, I think self-esteem has better titles and categories, like judgments about yourself, where the Bible says, you know, think with sober judgment. But... Um, our obsession with self-esteem is, I think, setting up a lot of the rage 
that we see um, with the young adults because people have lived through terrible times. The plague would sweep through and just wipe out families and towns. People have lived through times where they've starved. The, we live in the wealthiest society in the wealthiest port of human history with the most conveniences, with the most luxuries, and the levels of rage that some people can achieve, people who are, you know, grew up with stuff. I, I tend to think a lot of the rage is much more explained by not what you get, but the disjunct between what you expected, what you were told, you can do anything, you can be anything, you're special, you're, you know, and then you hit life, and life's not, you know, you just show up to middle school and kids are mean to you. That disjunct between what you were expecting and what you think you deserve and what you get is the, the gap that I think rage fills. Um, and so I, I think one of the bypro- unintended byproducts of the self-esteem movement is tremendously setting people up for shock, confusion, and dismay when their boss doesn't treat them like a little ray of sunshine, you know, and when the world doesn't treat them like they have limitless potential and everything else. I mean, there's certainly a healthy place to tell people they're made in the image of God and they're capable of some great things if they work hard, but we sort of disconnected that from any sort of value as opposed to if you work hard, if you commit yourself, you can do things. Cut that off. You are special and wonderful and, you know, um, and, yeah, I could talk about self-esteem for a long time, but... Greg, you have to get in line. There's Carol Hardy behind you there. But, Greg, you're next. We're going to have a circle going here. We'll be good. Carol. This is uh, just really brief. I'm tagging on to what Jake said about yeah. when it's grown up, these attitudes and lack of discipline and so forth. I'm wondering if, it, uh, if we have a, a visual of it, of uh, watching what happened in Portland and, and, and Seattle. I, I mean, tend, is I, that it when it's grown up? I think, I think in many cases, yes. It sure looks like it in many cases. Yeah. Um, no one ever said, why have you done such and such? What have you done? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it, there's a proverb that often gets quoted that very well might be misunderstood. Train up a child according to his own way, and when he's old, he'll not depart. Um, it's credibly actually a threat. The phrasing, according to his way, could be translated left alone. It, Raise up a child according to his bone bent, his, what he wants. And when he's old, he will not depart. It's entirely possible. I got some commentaries that argue it, um, I think, pretty compellingly, that rather than saying, if you do a good job as a parent, even though your kid strays, you'll come back. Rather, they get set in stone. <laughs> and if the way they get set is one way, good, good luck. Um, I mean, there's obviously remarkable transforming grace that can happen. But in general, good luck. Greg, you're well, next. I was just going to yeah. suggest that the gap that you were talking about between what I think I deserve and what I get would explain all the mass killings I, in I, schools. I tend to think so, you know, yeah. some of those people that didn't kill themselves and you you were able to talk to them or they left a, some sort of manifesto or something. Yeah. It was all about um, not getting what they thought they were going to get. Yeah. Uh, and and I watch a lot of a lot of uh, sports on TV, right. and I'm just amazed the number of people that are out on the floor or out on the field will headbutt somebody or take a helmet and smash it in, in and say, "Well, they disrespected me." Right. What? I mean, that's never happened before. All right. Uh, lucky you. No, C.S. Lewis gives a very helpful. I, I know I've said this before. I, I quote Lewis all the time. He's, his metaphors are, are so helpful. But to imagine a dingy, poorly furnished hotel room with stains on the walls and beds broken, and imagine the experience emotionally of two different groups of people, one who thought they were, had paid for a five-star hotel and one people you're smuggling out of a concentration camp. They both are told, you've got to stay here for a week, then we're going to move you on. They probably have pretty different experiences. <laughs> and it's all going to come down to what you expect and where you're coming from. If you expect five star hotels, you're going to be outraged at this dingy apartment. If you thought you were going to die in a concentration camp and someone smuggled, you're going to be thankful for this. Um, ab- absolutely, what we expect, what we think we need, um, 
fuels ev everything else. Um, I want to make one other point quickly that I didn't make in the message. That This is where Ted Tripp's book is so helpful. Under the point of being stewards, we're really under shepherds for our children. So God says, we saw this in the, in the fifth commandment quoted last week, that honor your mother and father that may go well with you. There's a blessing attached, right? So Ted Tripp talks about a circle of blessing. When a kid is embracing, he's not resisting the honoring and, and, and obeying their parents. They're in this sort of circle of blessing. God's going to bless them, right? So my job as a shepherd is to point them to that circle, to call them to that circle. And the, the, the danger, this, I mean, this blew my mind when I first read this um, back 20 years ago, is that it's quite possible for me, because I've lowered the standard to something the kid can do, to tell them they're in that circle of blessing when they're not, they're off in the woods. G give an example. Let's just say I accept obedience, not right away, all the way with a happy heart, but I accept grumbling obedience, or I accept obedience at three and a half point nine. you know. I'm all, I'm one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. Okay, they did it. And I praise them for that. And I, there can be room to say, hey, that's better than last time. It's still not what you need to do, but last time I had to count to eight, now I only count to two. But I actually say, well done. And what I'm telling them is, you are in that circle of blessing. They're not. That's actually damaging. That's harmful, right? This gets back to understanding who God is. If I train them that God gives you till two and a half, and he never does anything painful, he, never does, he, never, he just loves and accepts and lets you be you, I tend to think that might explain a lot of mainline Christianity. And why we as Christians can wrestle with the fact that God disciplines us. And why that can be so hard for us to hear. Because we never had parents who disciplined us. That the Hebrews chap passage in chapter 12 makes a connection. Just as we all had. And we're supposed to understand, oh yeah, of course, our fathers disciplined us. God loves us. He disciplines us. Well, that whole thing breaks down if, if the parents aren't providing that model. So, understanding that... The circle of blessing doesn't move. God's standard doesn't change. God says the conditions into which it's going to be well with a child. My job is simply like a tour guide or a shepherd to say, okay, that's the good pasture, that's the safe ground, that's the dangerous place, that's your inviting discipline. And, and the other point being, as a parent, I discipline so that God doesn't have to use other means. Because if God loves my kids, he's going to discipline them. He calls me to do it, and if I neglect that, if he loves my kids, he'll discipline them, right? I'd like to be the one to do it so it doesn't have to be something else, you know? Um, and so that's sort of the way we got to view this is we're stewards. We are meant to teach them things, and I was talking about expiation. One of, one of the reasons why I think physical discipline is, is something you cannot do without, and I think you can supplement it with other things, is that ultimately, um, pain points to death, right? I mean, it, it connects. God doesn't give Jesus a time out on the cross. He crushes him and lashes him, and by his stripes we are healed. There's a connection between the physical suffering of Jesus, the language used to describe it, and discipline, right? Um, and so I'll tell my kids that on the cross, Jesus took their spanking. And it, it makes sense. On the cross, God spanked Jesus in your place. I use the language that they have when they're little enough. Um, because what you understand is there's sin, there's atonement, there's, there's, there's discipline, and that discipline removes the wrath. The other thing that's wonderful about core physical discipline is it's over immediately. It's over immediately. We can be fully restored. It's taken away. They get expiation, the, the doctrine that's that wrath is removed, the taking away of anger and wrath, the restoring of a relationship. So more than any other form of discipline, this does set up and picture gospel categories. Um, and it gives you an opportunity when you're talking to your kids to, to bring the gospel to bear. What You've, you've broken the law. You, there, there must be consequences. But once that punishment is metered, it's resolved, and we can be restored. And it's all it takes is your confession and asking for forgiveness, and I'll gladly, gladly grant it. And let me tell you about God and the forgiveness he grants. And the dis I mean, these, these things connect in ways that 
well, you need a timeout, and God put a Jesus on a timeout. On the, it doesn't really work as well. Um, which is these things can be used and supplemented, but biblically, this is the center, this is the standard, this is the starting point, and then I'd bring in other things to help along. Let me make one other point. This is primarily dealing with folly. Um, as, a kid, as my children grow older, I'm able to reason with them more, and consequently, the, the, the consequences can be different. Um, you can't reason with folly, but I can usually reason with my 11-year-old. It's, it's seldom that I'm dealing with that rank folly and foolishness with him. And so we've, in many respects, left much of that behind in moving the new forms of teaching and instruction because there's no real question, are you willing to be my son? Are you willing to honor your mother and father? I've, I've told all my kids this. I've, they know this. You, you're welcome to live in my home as long as you're not married. <laughs> Two conditions. You're doing something useful with your time. You're not playing Xbox all day. Something useful. You don't have to be making money. Just something useful. Something profitable with your time, and you're willing to honor and obey your, your mother and father. If we, you got a home here until you get married. You can stay here. If, 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 uh, if that comes to be disputed, you will eventually, if that dispute can't be resolved, have to leave. I told them this now. I don't want to have to th- say that when they're teenagers, if any of my kids start to rebel as a teenager. I want them to know. These are the conditions. Find something useful to do with your time. Honor and obey your mother and father. We're good. Good. Um, that's, yeah, oh, Lee. Yes. Well, I hate to just, br- I agree with all that, of course, but the, the, my, <laughs> my next, but. my no, this, this has actually nothing to do with that, but I oh. did want to insert, last yeah. week somebody brought up the question about grandparents, oh, and yeah, so yeah. often we hear people say, oh, you, I bet you just spoil them rotten and then send them home, and I say, I would never do that, because A, I have to spend time with them, and B, the parents don't want a bunch of spoiled brats returned to them. So what I find is with, I actually, you know, you know, I watch Liz's kids uh, a couple days a week, yeah. that I am, I look at myself as in loco parentes, yeah. so, and they agree with me. They're, we're totally all on the same page of what is discipline, right. how we're going to treat yeah. them, so that the kids get a consistent uh, behavior expectation wherever they go at home. Yeah. And uh, I just think that's the way to go. And I hate it when people say, oh, you're just going to spoil them. It's like, no, it's, but it is true. I do want them there's to a go, go Pro- away at the end of the day. There's but- a reason that, there's a place that proverb comes from. I don't know what happened to my mother, but both of my, Talitha and Eliana have got a Philadelphia attorney on retainer pro bono. And whenever they're involved, the door to her side will sort of crack open. And... <laughs> And if there can be a defense that can be made, it will be made. Yeah. Um, but no, no, absolutely, the question about grandparents, you want to act, talk to your kids and you want to coordinate and supplement. You, 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 the best thing for my kids is not only to get a consistent standard in my home, they get a consistent standard from all the Christians they know, yeah. right? Ideally, they're, get, they're hearing the same thing. They're seeing the same thing from everyone. Um, one of the other things that our culture says that I don't, I don't know where this comes from, is only the mother or father could discipline. I'd say that whoever is the local parent, whoever you're entrusting them to, I, I wouldn't take someone's kids for any length of time if I couldn't, because very quickly the kids get to figure out you got nothing to back that up with. Yeah, and also right? even I would encourage yeah. the older, the parents, yeah, all, yeah. like you say about uh, the kids all have the same expectations that, like if I see a kid running in church, I will tell them cuz I'm the grandma I say stop running yeah. you're in church and call you know and I think we yeah. all need to do make sure we do that to kind of help cuz that's helping out the parents too cuz they can't be yeah. everywhere every second so. right no no absolutely we live in a different world you're more likely now if someone's if you're at the mall and someone's kid is running and you told them to stop you're more likely to get in trouble for that we live in a very different world than we used to um, and so yeah we we want as grandparents, I'm not a grandparent, as grandparents, grandparents want to supplement and reinforce and maintain the parents' vision for what the standards are uh, in the home. The, you want it to be as consistent and seamless as possible. Because again, kids learn. They learn how to play one parent against the other. They learn who the softy is. This all comes hardwired naturally to them. 
And so they will exploit weaknesses, inconsistencies, and division. They'll just naturally do it. I mean, we do the same thing. It's not like just children do it, but they, they do it well, you know? Um, and so we want as much consistency and as little daylight between us as possible. Okay. Oh, Bridget. Um, so with the consistency, not to make it like too personal, but lately struggling with Asher and Violet, sometimes I will hold her to a higher standard because she's older and she is more responsible. Yeah. But I can kind of struggle with like not wanting to be hypocritical. I don't know. Like what are your practical so, thoughts so the on that? What I mean by the standard is the ethical component, the obeying mom and, mom and dad. A child who's not been trained to sit through service, it would be unreasonable to hold them to that standard. If you've trained um, your at Violet to do so, expecting her to do what you know she can do, and not expecting him to do it, you're not having. In one sense, there are two different standards. It's age appropriate, developmentally appropriate. The standard of you will endeavor to honor and obey your mother and father is non-negotiable. That's why we can't have different standards. When God calls it sin, but there's a sense in which our church service length is arbitrary. Why do we meet for an hour, an hour and ten minutes? Why not three hours? Why not thirty minutes? Why? It's arbitrary. And so there's nothing righteous about a child needs to be able to sit for, still for 45 minutes. There is a value. I mean, the, the, the thinking of why to do that is it's good for family to worship together. In order to worship together, we all need certain attendant skills, like being able to sit still for an hour and 15 minutes. Therefore, it's important, as soon as I can, to train my children to do that so we can worship together, so we can, right? But it, there's a sense in which it's arbitrary. The part that's not is the you will respect your mother and father. You will endeavor to obey. And, and those don't negotiate. Like, I only ex- I ex- if you were expecting Violet to be more zealous in honoring you and Zach than Asher, yeah, that's rough. But what they can do, what they're capable of, of course that's going to be separate. Absolutely. Well, it's kind of like once I tricked my kids. Um, Serena's having a hard time getting them to clean something. And I said, I'll pay you each 10 bucks if you clean it. Oh, man, they got it spotless. Hey, guess what? Now I know you can do that. I'm never paying you again. (laughs) Now I know what you can do, right? We've proven it. We've proven it. So don't tell me you can't do it. So so there's a sense which once I know what you can do, um, it's, uh, it's... then holding them to that is, is different. I mean, partly as parents, we're studying, what can our kid do? What can't they do? But once you see them capable of something, then calling on them to do that is, I think, reasonable and good. Um, sometimes it can be challenging knowing exactly what they're capable of. In my experience, we generally underestimate what they can do rather than overestimate. But still, it's fair enough. Um, trying to discern whether you're dealing with... One of the most difficult ones for us, although God was good, this became clear, with Talitha... Serena had um, taught her baby sign language to say thank you. And she was all proud of it. And she's like, Daddy, can you give Talitha a glass? And I gave her the glass. Hey, Talitha, say thank you. And she just looked stone-faced at me. And she's like, no, no, she can do it. Wait, say, hold on. You know, thank you. This is thank you, right? No, this is thank you? I don't even know. Um, (laughs) and, And she just looked at me. She didn't have like a mean face on her face. She just... And I'm like, ah, oh, she apparently doesn't. No, no, Serena's like, she knows. Well, now Serena's making a deal, so I got to back her up. So I'm like, okay. And she puts her in her lap. Okay, say thank you to daddy. And Talitha just. And so backing up Serena, eventually, I'm like, okay, if you insist, you made this a deal. So I go put her in her crib as a form of d- discipline. Um, you, you didn't do what mommy said. And then after like 10 minutes, Serena said, why don't you go check on her? So I go and check on her. And I come in. You know, they, they can like curl up like a bug. And... I came and I said, hello, Dallas. And she popped up all happy. And I said, can you say thank you to Daddy? And she goes, and then she curled back up in a ball again. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> she knows exactly what's going on. I'm like, okay. Um, and so, but sometimes you can't tell, right? That was, I mean, that's why I'm like, Serena, we, <laughs> we have to finish working through this because you were absolutely right. She knows exactly what you're asking her to do. And she just doesn't want to do it. And, you know, try to discern, do they understand what you're asking them to do? Do they know? I don't know. I mean, that, that, that can be challenging. Um, but 
expecting them to do the fundamental commandments God requires to talk respectfully, to, to try to obey when they know what you want them to do. This is a long way of saying there should be no double standard in regards to that, what you're calling on them to do, what responsibilities you give them. Of course, that's going to be age dependent. I mean, my kids would I mean, just readily, of course, Abner, who has greater responsibilities, has other privileges. He can stay up later some nights and he, of course, and when you're older, you can do the same thing. I have no problem saying that there's different standards for different kids in that sense. The standard that you endeavor to obey mommy and daddy is for everybody. It's just going to look different for different people. Does that help at all? Okay. Um, five minutes. Bennett. Thank you. Um, I was going to say um, one problem. Look, when you were talking about something back a ways ago, and I, um, it was in chapter 8, verse 3, and it was a wonderful quote. Um, I, now my vision is starting to get very blurry, and I feel like I'm going to go into seizure. Okay. Um, I hope you won't. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would, um, grace to Bennett, that you would uh, give her a full use of her body mind and that um, whatever needs she has, you would supply them. We pray that you would uphold her even as you uphold us. We think of others in our body, uh, Ron, dealing with physical infirmity, uh, Patty, loss of Wendell, and Lord God, you are the great physician. You hold us in your hands. Uh, We're not as aware of it as some are, but our every breath comes from you. you. You give us life. You uphold us. So, Lord, we look to you. We pray that you would give grace, that you would give strength and health uh, to Bennett, to Patty, to Ron, to others, to us. We might be faithful, we might serve you. Lord God, I pray that we would be faithful as we leave. I pray that you would um, raise up our children using us, and that you would um, cause them to fear you and know you, to honor you that they would spend eternity with you. That is our great desire for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.